Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this third Sunday in Lent. So glad that you can join us. The saving love of God, the transforming peace of Christ, and the driving power of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Amen. Now let us keep some moments of silence for reflection. Let us pray together. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy upon us. Our will is manacled to sin, and we cannot break free. We are lost and wounded and cannot find our way home or heal ourselves. We regret the hurtful things we have said or shared and the opportunities when we failed to speak up. We lament the occasions we have wallowed in self-righteousness and the times we have given in to self-loathing. We ache recalling how our fear pride, greed, and pettiness have diminished our trusting faith in you and our empathy for and relationships to others. For the wrongs we have done, for the good we have failed to do, for falling short of the fullness for which you create, rescue, and empower us, forgive us, restore us, strengthen us, we pray. God is gracious and full of compassion slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit and by the powerful vulnerability of Jesus Christ, God rescues us from the powers of this world, forgives our sins, and renews our hearts to love and serve God's world. Live in the newness of life. Amen.
Let us pray together. Holy God, the folly of the cross unravels our human wisdom and the weakness of the crucified puts worldly dominance to shame. By the power flowing from Jesus' resurrection, raise all people from the ways of death and fashion us into a living temple for you. Through Jesus Christ, our rescuer and ruler, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The second reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. The Apostle Paul writes, The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we invite the children to pay particular attention as we have a time that's especially for them. Oh, hey, hey, Bear, good to see you. Hi, hey, hey. hey, kid. So good to see you. Are, are you sleepy, Bear? I am sleepy. I overslept my alarm. I set my alarm for March 4th, but I actually didn't pick up until March 7th today, so <gasps> I'm a little sleepy. Well, it's good to have you there. I'm glad, I'm glad you're here. Um, I bet you're, you're pretty hungry. Oh, I'm very hungry after that long nap. Yes, I am. Um, so do, do you like to eat honey? <gasps> do I like to eat honey? That is a ridiculous question. Of course I like to eat honey. Honey is the best. It goes this, and then berries, and then honey. Nothing is better than honey. Ah, I, I, I hear what you say. Um, but um, one of the, the things that we hear from the Bible today, oh, the Bible, I haven't heard that in months, because I was high there in <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, so in, in the Bible, there's this thing called songs. Psalm. Are they crunchy? <laughs> no, they're, they're not crunchy. They're like they're like songs or, or poems. Oh, poems. I like poems. Go on. Yes. Yeah, so um, and one of these poems talks about something 
that is even sweeter than honey. <gasps> Can there be such a thing as sweeter than honey? I had no idea. What is it? What is it? What is it? Well, it is, it's the word of God. Oh, the word of God. I don't understand. What is this word of God you speak of? Uh, well, um, the word of God is actually, it's, it's many different things. It's, uh, it's when we share the, the good news of God's love with other people. And um, we even say that, that Jesus himself was the word of God made, made human. And Jesus was sweeter than honey. Um, yeah, did somebody lick his face? Is that how they know that? Well, no, that, it, it, we're getting off, off topic here. We'll get it back on topic. Well, another thing that we say is the word of God is, is the Bible, is, is all of the stories and the songs and the poems that are in the Bible that tell us about um, God's love. Ooh, just one moment, please. I will be right back. What are you doing, Bear? That was not sweet. I believe you are mistaken. Blech. Well, I didn't mean the actual book, the, like the, the pages of the Bible. Well, then what do you mean? I mean that the message about God in Jesus Christ is what is so sweet. Oh, yes, it's, it's the message that God loves us, that when we're when we're tired or when we're sad, God loves us. When we're hurting, God loves us. When other people are hurting and God wants us to share that good news of God's love for them, that is also good. And that that, my friend, is sweeter than anything you can imagine. Wow. So that's why you share these stories. Exactly. So that the children will know that God's love and the message about God's love is the sweetest thing that there can possibly be. And so it's not just that we have to listen to the story. Oh, hear that, children? You don't have to listen to the story. You can go now. No, 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 let me finish. Oh, wait, finish. Uh, don't go away yet. Okay, go ahead. We don't have to listen to the stories. We get to listen to the stories. Oh, you get to listen to the stories because they are sweet, sweeter than honey. Okay? Right. Now I'm hungry. See you later. Bye bye. Thank you, Bear. Holy Gospel for today is according to John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, this story that we're going to hear today is one that the other gospel writers remember as happening at the very end of Jesus' career, just as he comes into Jerusalem for his final week. But John, who we're hearing from today, remembers this event as happening very near the beginning of Jesus' Career. So this happens shortly after Jesus has transformed the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. And so it begins. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop 
making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Judeans then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Judeans then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice, and yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. We are striving to forge a union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. Just a little bit of the powerful words from the wonderful poem, The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman, 22 years old, who shared that poem at the recent inauguration and almost overnight became a, an icon for hope and for beauty and for power and for commitment to being better together as a people. And yet, just this very past Friday night, as she was walking home uh, to her own home, she noticed that she was being tailed by a security guard who approached, uh, as she approached her building, the guard approached her and demanded to know if she lived there. He said, you look suspicious. She says, I showed my keys and buzzed myself into the building. He left no apology. This is the reality of black girls, she says. One day you're called an icon, the next day a threat. In a sense, she says, he was right. I am a threat, a threat to injustice, to inequality, to ignorance, Anyone who speaks the truth and walks with hope is an obvious and fatal danger to the powers that be. The issue isn't that the security guard was just doing his job. The issue is that if this same 22-year-old woman had been white, he very likely would have been far less suspicious of her. Racism is not just overt acts that we do or overt words that we say, but it's, it's systems around us that we have allowed to grow up around us and in which we have lived so long that we hardly even see them anymore or recognize them. They result in greater poverty, in greater illness, in more pollution, in so many things more for our Black sisters and brothers, our Latino brothers and sisters, our Native American brothers and sisters, than for those of us who are white. I am a threat, she says, to injustice, inequality, and ignorance. Anyone who speaks the truth and walks with hope is an obvious and fatal danger to the powers that be. And we people of faith are reminded that we have a long history of being protesters, of being people who speak the truth and walk with hope. We hear today about the gift that Moses brings down from the mountain to give to the people. And Moses, remember, 
was a protester. Moses protested against Pharaoh and the injustice and the cruelty that he inflicted upon the people. And he called also the people themselves to be who God had made them to be, a blessing for all peoples. And yes, he blundered. He was not perfect. At one point, he had to flee for his own life to another land. But by God's power, he walked with hope. In the face of Pharaoh's cruelty, he committed civil disobedience, even committing property destruction, Moses did. What were the plagues but the destruction of the property of the oppressors? He walked with hope and led the people to walk with hope through the wilderness into their promised future. And we hear today the story of how God gave to Moses to give to the people a roadmap of what it looks like to live as people who speak the truth and walk with hope, the commandments. Moses, a protester who walked with hope. And Jesus himself, so many things that, that Jesus is. He is, he is a healer and a, and a teacher. He is a comforter. He is kind and gentle and compassionate. And at times, he is a zealous protester against injustices and against wrongful worship and wrongful way of being the people of God. This story that we hear of Jesus today is nothing other than zealous civil disobedience and, again, even committing property destruction in what he does. But he, he speaks and acts with zeal, with passion for what God has called him to be and do and say, and he calls the people themselves to be who God has made them to be, not to settle for less than who God has called them to to be a blessing to all peoples. And Jesus spoke truth and walked with hope, healing and teaching and liberating. Eventually, it resulted in his being executed by the government. And yet, he was resurrected, brought forth into a new kind of life that could never be conquered again by death, and opened to us through that death and resurrection also a way into that, that everlasting life, that, that life of fulfillment, of wholeness, that frees us from fear of what others might think of us, of what others might say of us if we blunderingly seek to speak truth and walk with hope. The Apostle Paul, we hear him speaking today to the church in Corinth and to us as well, protesting yet again against false understandings of what it means to be a follower of God and calling the people anew to be who God has called them to be, a blessing to all peoples. And yes, Paul blundered occasionally. Remember that this is the one who started his career persecuting the very Christians whom now he encourages with his letters, often was beaten and jailed and eventually was executed by the government for speaking truth and for walking with hope and yet continued to do so. And his words, his letters, his wisdom in the foolishness of God through Jesus Christ comes to us today as a gift. We are inheritors of the gifts of Martin Luther, who, remember, sparked a movement that became, came to be known as the Protestant Reformation, the Reformation of those who are protesters. And he called God's people to be who God made them to be, a blessing for all people. And yes, Luther blundered. He was not perfect. At the end of his life, he, was, he said things that were anti-Semitic. And yet he also was a servant of God, seeking to speak the truth of God's grace, given to us as a free gift, not something that we need to earn. And he spoke truth and walked with hope. And for that, he was excommunicated by the leaders of the church. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Lutheran pastor who protested against the Nazi regime and called God's people to be who God had made them to be, a blessing for all peoples, and started a Protestant version of the church, the confessing church, that, that would not kowtow to Hitler and to the, the regime of cruelty and hatred, but stood up against it 
and spoke for the power of Christ as our one leader who calls us to be a blessing to all people. And, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer himself occasionally blundered. He failed to speak up sooner against the persecution of the Jews and regretted that. And yet, through the power of God's presence in him and the community around him, he had the courage to speak the truth and to walk with hope. And where did it get him? It got him jailed and hanged, executed by the state. And yet the gift of his wisdom and of his courage and of his words and of the way he lived his life comes to us today as a gift and a strength. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. protested against injustice and called God's people to be who God had made them to be, a blessing for all people. And yes, he too blundered. He had his personal faults. And yet, despite all of that, he, together with a community of others around him, spoke truth and walked with hope. And for that courage and for that proclamation, he was assassinated. And yet, the movement that he was part of continues today in so many ways. The church at the center and at the head of that protesting, of that zeal, of that passion, of that speaking up on behalf of those who are suffering injustice and demanding that we as a society live more in the image of the reign of God, of what God calls the world to be and calls the church and people of faith to lead in making that more real, more embodied in the world today, wherever we are. In the play Hamlet, Hamlet's mother Gertrude at one point watching a play within the play speaks of the character there and says, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. Sometimes I'm afraid that I hear the Holy Spirit say, the church doth protest too little, methinks. The church doth protest too little, methinks. Yes, God comforts us in our afflictions. Thank God. And we need it. We are worn down and we are exhausted and we are fragile because of all the things that we have been going through with this pandemic and with the economic stresses and with the divisions in our country and in our world and we are worn down and God does comfort us in those afflictions. God is with us and God says, I love you no matter what else is going on. You don't have to prove yourself worthy for me to love you. I love you exactly as you are and I give you my grace and my presence and my comfort and my strength in the midst of your afflictions. But not merely so that you can Oh, just catch your breath and feel fine. And like, okay, well, I'm glad. That's, I'm glad. I, I've got God's presence. I'm all right. Too bad for those other people who don't have that. At least I feel a little bit better now. No, God gives us that comfort in our, in our afflictions in order that we may be a comfort to others in their afflictions, in order that we may be a voice that speaks up for those who are hurting. God gives us strength in the midst of our weariness, not for our own sake only, but for the sake of the world that we may be a blessing to all peoples. God fills us even with zeal and passion, even in the midst of this time. Not, not each of us will do the same things at the same time all the time. We are a community and together we can, we can support one another. And sometimes one may step forward while another needs to step back. And then we take turns moving forward and supporting one another. But as a people of God, we need to be those to whom the world looks and says, there. There are people who are filled with zeal and with passion. There are people who care about those who are suffering injustice, who are suffering oppression, who speak up and act on behalf. The world needs to look to the church and say, there, there is a people who are a threat to injustice, inequality, and ignorance. Anyone who speaks the truth and walks with hope is an obvious and fatal danger to the powers that be. Oh, God, Holy Spirit, comfort us in our afflictions and fill us with zeal and passion to speak the truth and walk with hope to be a people of holy protesting on behalf of God's people. Let us walk with hope. Amen.
Let us pray together. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal and in our fasting, prayer, works of love, and other disciplines, signs of our gratitude and our commitment to love and serve your world. Amen. Why do you test the Lord? Moses asked the unsatisfied people who left slavery. Feverish work, the burden of taskmasters, who force them to make bricks without straw, to build empires from the sweat of their brow. Wandering loose in the desert, they were still slaves of their hearts, unliberated in their minds and their souls. Unaware of God's presence with them, manna in the morning, life from hard and difficult places, water from rock, tasting salvation upon their lips. Deep calls to deep as our souls cry to you. Sleep to the one who made earth and its seas, not being able to see the glory and the suffering, the hope and the pain. We strive to make sense of our turmoil and our toil. And we often miss the waters that are poured out around us and into us, and drinking in the presence of God. As we encounter the water at Jacob's well, depth echoes back, but we continue to thirst. For water is not dug from the work of our hands, to not drink from empty wells and broken cisterns that carry nothingness. And opening my eyes above these waters, I see my history in a pool of memories committed to filling my own cup and sustaining my own thirst, trying to quench a parched soul with one person or another one thing or another. Coming back to the void and seeing myself just looking straight back. I've eaten bread from the labors of my hand, threshed through fields, cut my hands on thorns and thistles, land lashing back at me, exchanging one job for another. This labor without end find eternal retirement and the very dirt that I've tilled. The waters that call us to this place come from eternal springs, flowing forth from a distant garden to feed fertile grounds that yield a harvest of plenty, to fill desert lands, to spring forth from the heart so that we might do the work of the one who sent us, work full and filling sends us forward to our awaited future.
We are what God made us to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve our neighbor. God bless us that we may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Go in peace, speak the truth, walk with hope, serve the Lord. By the presence and power of God, we will.